Good morning, church. I welcome you all for this Sunday morning service. Before we get into a time of worship, I just thought I'll read a small passage from Psalm 63. I'm reading from the Living Bible version. Just the first five verses. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. So the title of the psalm, it says here that it's a psalm which David wrote while he was in the wilderness of Judah. So we all go through different seasons in our life. There are times where we are really happy, everything goes well for us. And it's very easy for us to stay connected to God. But there are also seasons of dryness in our life where we struggle to connect with God. And this is one such time for David. He's hiding in the wilderness. He's hiding from his enemies where he's, he's scared. He's trying to preserve his life. He's worried about his life. But even at this time, he says, your unfailing love is better than life. So the response that David gives during this time of dryness, we see that David put his whole trust and confidence in God, that he was able to constantly remind himself of the goodness of God in his life. He reminded himself about how the Lord helped him to tear open the mouth of the lion. He rem reminded himself about the victory that God gave him against the giant Goliath. He reminded himself of how the Lord exalted him from a sh lowly shepherd boy to the throne as a king. He also remembered the victory that God gave him in all his battles. And he remembered God's forgiveness, his unfailing love, his mercy and forgiveness in his life. And all, all of his life, he kept constantly thinking about these things that he says, that the love of God is more valuable and precious to him than his life. Therefore, he says, I will open up my mouth, my lips, and I will glorify him. I will glorify him with my lips. I will praise him all the days of my life. Not just during good times or bad times, but every day of his life, he has made the choice to praise his Savior. And he says, I will lift up my hands as a symbol of surrender to God, and I will praise Him. Thus will I be satisfied. So when He opens His, when He remembers the goodness of God, He opens up His mouth, His lips automatically, is, uh, His heart is stirred, and His lips want to glorify God. And He lifts up His hands in total surrender, because the Lord is everything to Him, in all times, whether it's good or bad. And then he feels the satisfaction. He feels the joy that raptures his soul. So having said that, why don't we just rise up to our feet and prepare our hearts to worship our God. For this is the reason why we are here. Precious Heavenly Father, we want to thank and praise you for this wonderful time. Lord, we thank you for this privilege that you have given each and every one of us to come into your sanctuary this morning. And Lord, we are gathered here because of you. Yes, Spirit of God, it's all about you. There is no other reason why we have come. We have come this morning, Lord, to forget about everything that weighs our heart down. And we want to fix our eyes upon you this morning. Holy Spirit of God, we welcome you in this place. For without you, our worship is empty. Come, Lord. Come down and help your people. Help us to worship you, Lord. Set our spirits free. Take away every hindrance, every block, 
and release your anointing upon your people. I pray that your spirit will brood over this place. Have your way in the midst of your people this morning. Stir every heart, Lord, gathered here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Let your name alone be glorified. And we want to give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's put our hands together, church, as we do this song, Hosanna, Praise is Rising.
with God. Come Lord, have your way among us. Have your way among us, oh Lord. We welcome you, sweet spirit. We welcome your sweet presence in this place, oh Father. Our hearts are turning to you this morning. Our lives are turning to you. And we want to fix our eyes on you alone this morning, Jesus. Yes, Lord, it's only in your presence that we find the strength that we need to face the days. Hallelujah. It's only in your presence that all our fears are washed away. We have nothing to fear. There's nothing but peace, safety, and security. And we worship your name, Lord. We worship you for you alone are worthy of all our praises. There is no other name that is worthy, O oh God. We've come here to lift up your name this morning. Come on, church. We've come here to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will help us, Lord, to give the glory, the honor, and the praise that is due unto your name. Your name alone is a strong and mighty tower, Lord. And we've come this morning to run into it and hide. Yes, Father, for that is our place of safety and security. Jesus, hallelujah, we thank you Lord, 
thank you father for your name that is a strong tower yes jesus we thank you lord and we pray lord that you will teach us during our times of trials and difficulties not to run to any man or father but to run into your name for you have given us your name oh father that will that is a hiding place for us oh master it is a place when we run and hide and take shelter in your name there is power in your name and father we are protected from the evil schemes of the wicked one oh master we thank you for your beautiful name oh father we thank you that there is power in your name the power to bring down the shackles of the enemy there is power to break every chain there is power lord jesus hallelujah to bring down your healing to bring down your deliverance among your people we thank you lord for this comfort that you have given us so master to call on your name yes father even as the psalm says in psalm 9:10 those who know your name will put their trust in you for you have not forsaken those who seek you yes master david knew the power of your name and that is the reason why he went up to goliath in the name of the lord he did not go before him with spears or with a sword but he went in the name of the lord he understood he truly understood the power in your name yes father in this morning we want to worship your holy name we want to praise you we want to bless your holy name of oh we want to magnify your name we want to exalt your name above every other name in this world oh master for you are our strength you are our joy hallelujah
worship you, Father. The Lamb of God that is seated on the throne, you alone are worthy to receive all praise, all honor, all glory, all power. There is no one like you, Jesus. You are the King of kings. You are the glorious, resurrected Lord. You alone are God. You are holy. You are blameless, seated on the throne. You are righteous. You are our rock, our refuge. We worship you this morning, oh Father. You are the great I am. You alone are worthy to receive the highest praises this morning. Yes, Father, for we were created to worship you. We were created to stand amazed and to stand in awe of your glory. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you will have your way in our lives this morning. Sweep across this place this morning. Lord, I pray that you will rekindle the fires of our first flame, oh God. I pray that your spirit will move, that you will stir the hearts of your people. I pray that you will liberate your people this morning. For we want to be worshippers. Not just this day, we want to worship you. Forever you are the lamb that is seated. You alone are glorious. You are robed in splendor. You are mighty. You are awesome. There is none like you, Father. There is none like you. You alone deserve all praise. You deserve all glory. You alone are worthy. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God that you laid your life down. You offered your life. You bore all our suffering, all the suffering and pain. And you took the punishment, Lord, to liberate us, to set us free. And we want to thank you, Lord. Our hearts are filled with gratitude when we look upon where we were and where we are this day. Oh, it's all because of your love. It's all because of your mercy. It's all because of your grace, O oh Master. We have nothing in us. We have nothing in us, O oh Father. Spirit of God, we want to yield to your working. We surrender our lives to you, O oh Father. Lord, we pray that you alone will be glorified in everything that we say and do, O oh Master. We pray that you will teach us to worship you every day of our lives, in every situation. We want you to be glorified, O oh Master. Thank you, Jesus. We want to thank you, Father, for this wonderful time of worship that you have given us with our brothers and sisters together. It is a joy to come into your presence. It is a joy to offer our praises before you, O oh Master. For this is the reason why you created us and saved us. And Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful time that you have given us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you, will be, that you will continue to be exalted and glorified. We commit the rest of the service. We commit the word, the word into your hand. I pray that your spirit will speak to us, O Master. We commit everything, Lord, into your hand. Let your name alone be glorified, honored, and praised. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I wanted to share a story uh, today from God's word, uh, from the Old Testament uh, specifically. It's the story of uh, a man called Elijah. It's a, it's a wonderful story. Uh, moreover, it's actually a very thrilling story. Because I'm going to begin at that point in the story where Elijah uh, gets a threat. Okay? And it's a death threat. And in fact, he gets it from the most powerful person in the, in, in the whole nation. And the threat was, I'm going to murder you. Okay? I'm going to kill you within the next 24 hours. Right? And so that's where the story begins. I'm going to begin there. Right? It starts with him getting a death threat. And what happens to him after that is he goes through a series of um, negative emotions, you know, especially anxiety and, and fear and uh, you know, uh, discouragement and even anger. You know, I think all of us have obviously felt, you know, anxious at times. We felt afraid. We felt uh, uh, discouraged. But, you know, one thing to note here is in this story, he kind of feels all of these negative emotions all at once. You know, and it's a very overwhelming experience for uh, for Elijah. But what we learn from the story is, is how God cared about his feelings. Now, we know that God is, is passionate about his kingdom. Right? But God also cares very much about our feelings, about our uh, negative emotions especially. Right? And we learn how God helped him uh, deal with those negative emotions. Right? So God wants to help us deal with how we feel, especially our uh, you know, uh, emotions that overwhelm us. 
right? Like anxiety and fear and discouragement, right? So God knows these things overwhelm us and he wants to help us deal with, you know, how we feel, right? So, so let's go through this uh, story, okay? Uh, turn with me to 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to read to you from uh, verse 1 till verse 4. Starting from verse 1 to verse 4. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this tomorrow, if by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you, just as you have killed my prophets. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. The story starts by saying, when Ahab got home. Now, who is Ahab? Okay, Ahab is, is, uh, uh, is the king of Israel at that time. Right? Now, was he a good king? The Bible says he was actually a very bad king. In, in fact, he was worse than all the previous kings who reigned in that nation at that time. That's what the Bible says. So he was a very bad king because he led the people of Israel into pagan worship, worshipping Baal. And you know what happened when people engaged in pagan worship? People had to even sacrifice their sons and daughters. People sacrificed their own children to these gods of Baal and uh, Asherah and, and so on. And, and these are people who were once God's people. These are people who knew God, but, uh, but because of his leadership, the people were led into worshipping you know, false gods and, 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 and that even led to sacrificing their own sons, child sacrifice. And so that's how wicked you know, this king was. And, and he even led the whole country uh, in, in such wickedness. Right? And then it says, he told Jezebel. Right? Now, who's Jezebel? Jezebel is his wife. Now, even though the verse says he told Jezebel, I, I'd like to read it to myself saying he reported to Jezebel. You can guess why. Because that's the kind of relationship they had. Ahab and uh, Jezebel. It was not a husband and wife relationship. Even though they were married. It was a master-slave relationship. So who was the master? Jezebel was the master. Who was the slave? The husband was the slave. Maybe, maybe it's a picture of, you know, marriage in, in many homes. Right? It's not a husband and wife relationship. It's a master-slave relationship. And it's not necessary that the wife is always the master and the husband is the slave. In many houses, in fact, actually, the, the husband is like the master and the wife is like the slave. It's no surprise that, you know, uh, domestic abuse and violence and all such cases are increasing every year. Right? And, and it's shocking to see that. And, you know, even the number of divorce uh, cases going up. One of the reasons is because marriage in many homes is not according to God's original design for marriage. God's design for marriage was not a master-slave relationship. God's design for marriage is a love relationship where two individuals become one flesh. It's not even two people anymore. And it's a relationship that involves love and, and care for each other, where you cherish each other, right? It, it's not a master-slave relationship, but that's, that's what was, uh, you know, uh, that was the case in Ahab's house. Right? That's the kind of relationship they had. And so, whatever his wife said, that was final. His wife called the shots. Whatever she decides is final. So, the husband has to listen to whatever, you know, she, she decides or, or, or whatever she says. So he comes to Jezebel and he reports to her. And, and what did he say? He, he told her, you know, in verse 1, it says he, he told her everything that Elijah had done. <clears throat> now here's a background uh, to the story. Now who is Elijah? Elijah is a prophet. Right? He's, a, he's a great man of God. He's a man of prayer. And, and, and he loves God. He's passionate. And he, uh, Ahab tells Jezebel all that is, uh, Elijah did. Right, so just to give you the background in short, you can read the previous two chapters uh, you know, to have a full understanding of what was going on. 
But what happened was God sent Elijah, his prophet, right, a man who speaks for him. God sent Elijah to challenge the king Ahab and all the people of that nation, all the people who are worshipping this false god. Baal. God sent Elijah as one man to challenge you know, hundreds and hundreds, I think 850 prophets of the false gods. Just one man, all on, all on his own, facing King Ahab and all his people, all the people of you know, that, that nation who worshipped uh, Baal. And what was the challenge? He went to them and said, let's make a deal. Let's have a God contest. Let's have a competition. You pray to your false God. You pray to your God, Baal, and ask for a supernatural sign. And I'll pray to my God, the true living God, the God of Israel, whom you used to worship, and I'll pray to him and ask him for a supernatural sign. And now what's the sign? We're going to ask for fire to fall down from sky. And, and that fire is going to consume these, these offerings. So that's a supernatural sign. So you pray to God for that. I'll pray to my God for this. And whichever God answers is the true God. And he says, you need to make up your mind which God you want to worship. Do you want to worship the true God or you want to worship the false God? You have to make up your mind. You have to decide today. And so let's have this, this contest. And so Ahab is ready for it. You know, King Ahab is ready and he gathers all the... Uh, you know, all the prophets of Baal and all the people who worship Baal and they're all ready for the contest. And so the contest begins. And the first opportunity goes to Baal worshippers. And, 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 and the Bible says they, they started crying out desperately for Baal to bring down fire from the sky. They all started you know, crying and, and, and asking God, you know, God, uh, uh, God of Baal, you know, for this fire to fall down. But then the story says that Elijah began mocking them. There was no reply from Baal. There was no sound. Absolutely, it was just them crying out for the sign. And, and the Bible says Elijah started mocking them. He started asking questions like, uh, what happened to your God? Is he on a vacation? It's actually true. It's there in the Bible. Is he on a vacation? Is he, has he gone to Hawaii? Okay, that's my addition. But, but is he on a vacation? And... Uh, and he was like, is your God uh, deaf? Can he not hear? Maybe you need to shout louder. And uh, here's the funny thing. He, he, he actually said this. Is your God in the restroom? Is he in the loo? Is that why he can't hear you? Is that why he can't answer you? That's how he challenged them. Now, just a side note. This is not supposed to be a principle for us when it comes to evangelism. Okay, that's, not how we, <laughs> that's not how we share Jesus with people. Right? In the New Testament, the Bible says we are to share the gospel in love and in respect, in gentleness. So Elijah's calling was entirely different. It was a different time. It was specific to his ministry, right? But that's how he challenged. And so these people, you know, maybe they were so aggravated by, by his, you know, his, uh, his questions. They actually started taking knives and cutting themselves. Now, this is not a fantasy, right? There are many people who do that even today. They want to cut their bodies because they believe that pleases God whichever deity they, they uh, believe in and they believe God is going to answer them because they've cut their bodies and, and blood is gushing out and God somehow will be pleased by that and answer their prayers. So, so that's what they start doing. They start cutting their bodies. And the Bible again says, absolute silence, no reply, no response. From morning till evening, they all cried out, but no sign. And then it was Elijah's turn. And he prayed to the true living God. And the Bible says, instantly, immediately, there was a supernatural sign. Fire fell from sky and it consumed everything that was present there. And the Bible says, all the people who saw that, they fell face down and they realized who is the real God. They realized that the God of Israel is the true God. So here is Elijah sent by God challenging these prophets as one man facing all of them. And God stands with this man. You know that saying, right? Even if you're standing all alone and you're facing the whole world, you make up for the majority if God stands with you. That's what we see in the story. One man with God is, is the majority compared to the whole wide world, all the people in the world. And then Elijah prays for rain because there was famine in the land and he prays for rain and then, and then rain uh, comes. And then people come to see, you know, prayer only works if you're praying to the true living God. 
one of the reasons why i think we we lose confidence in prayer is because maybe we forget the fundamental thing that we are praying to the true living god we're not praying to a false god we are praying to a god who hears a god who is omniscient who knows everything who has all knowledge a god who is all powerful a god who is sovereign and and is in full control and so that's what we we see in the story as it begins and as soon as this happened ahab gets home tells uh, jezebel all that happened all that elijah did and then he tells her that elijah actually killed all the prophets of baal now the bible tells us you know that there are many people who stand like this you know as i'm holding the microphone here and speaking to you from god's word there are many people who who preach from the bible with uh, with bad motives right people who who teach false things and their only motive is to uh, you know is to gain financially right there are many false teachers people who do this for the wrong reasons and and the bible actually shows us that they are no different from from the false prophets who deceived the people they are no different from from the prophets who spoke lies who spoke things that people want to hear not what they need to hear spoke things what people want to hear so that they can they can uh, financially and personally benefit from it and and the bible says such people god will say to them i never knew you and they will be cast into hell eternally separated from god so what that means is judgment is going to be very real and it's going to happen to people who intentionally teach what is false for their personal benefit people who intentionally deceive you know the the, the masses of people who sit and listen to to the messages and that's kind of picture of what just happened because god used elijah to bring judgment on all the prophets who deceived people into worshiping the god of baal and and uh, ahab goes to you know goes to his wife and breaks this news to her and and she's she's just angry she is just absolutely furious when she hears this news because she is a worshiper of of baal uh, you know herself she she was one of the reasons why you know ahab also led the nation into uh, baal worship and so she's furious because elijah killed all her prophets and then what happens jezebel sends a message to elijah maybe she sends somebody to you know to to send that message to to uh, elijah and the message was here's what jezebel is saying the most powerful person in the country who is not ahab ahab was king but the one who was really in power was his wife so here's the message from the most powerful person in the country who has the army at her disposal and all the resources at her disposal here's the message from her i'm going to murder you i'm going to kill you at you know uh, within the next 24 hours in fact she says it's it's more emphatic she says may the gods strike me if i don't kill you by this time tomorrow and here's the crazy thing that happens to elijah you know a man who was so mighty in his stance for god a man who was so mighty in his you know uh, in in confronting these prophets these false teachers and a man who stood for god who was very bold all of a sudden the bible says he was very afraid when he heard the message he was able to stand before so many men but one message from one woman is able to make him afraid what's that saying uh, hell has no fury like a woman who is scorned right so this one message from from jezebel is you know puts a lot of fear in his heart and he's intimidated and he's overwhelmed and all of a sudden he's he's anxious and it's like he's going through an emotional roller coaster all of a sudden he's lost his confidence he's lost his trust uh trust in god you see it all happens when when we feel there is a threat so this was a death threat that's the ultimate threat you can give to any person but all of us feel anxious all of us feel uh, discouraged uh, especially you know we we become afraid and anxious when we face some kind of a threat right even if it's not something you know very serious in in nature for example if you're sitting for a job interview you face some kind of a threat right you you know you may, maybe you think that i'm not able to uh, maybe i won't be able to answer all the questions and so and so ultimately that's going to uh you know make me look bad right so so it's like your self image is threatened right every anxiety you know that we experience it comes from some kind of a threat that we sense some kind of a threat that we we feel it's when we feel threatened right and 
And fear and anxiety is always connected to the fear of the unknown, the fear of the uncertainty. When we don't know for sure what is going to happen, when we are not sure of the outcome, that's what brings us uh, anxiety and, and fear. And Elijah experienced the same thing. He was threatened. And then in verse 3 it says, Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. And we all know that fear makes us do one of two things. It makes us fight or flight. Right? That's the phrase. It makes us fight or flight, which means you want to either face it or you want to run away from it. You want to fight it or you want to flee it. Those are the two things we, you know, we, uh, we do when we have to deal with anxiety and fear. And what did Elijah do? He fled for his life. He ran for his life. He just wanted to get away from that, from that situation. And that was the beginning right, of, of his slow downfall. That was the beginning of a series of bad choices that he started making. You know, when, when someone is overwhelmed with anxiety and, and fear and uh, any kind of negative emotion, uh, most likely that person will start making a series of bad decisions. Let me show you some examples. Here's what, here's what he did, Elijah. In verse 3, he says he left his servant. That's the first thing he did. He went to this town and he left his servant. He had a servant and he left his servant there. Maybe that tells us something about how we want to disconnect from people. right? When we feel anxious or when we feel overwhelmed and overburdened with something, we don't want to see anybody's face. Right? We don't want to talk with anybody. We just, we just don't want to be in anyone's presence. We just want to be alone. We want to disconnect. So one of the first things he, you know, he did is he just left his servant and he just wanted to go away on his own. And in verse 3 he says, he left his servant and he went alone. And another common thing we do when we, you know, when we are affected emotionally is we isolate ourselves. Right? We want to separate ourselves from, from, from people. We want to be all by ourselves. Right? And actually, isolating yourself makes the problem worse. Whatever negative emotion it is that you're feeling, it actually makes it even worse. You know, one of the means that God uses to, to help us, you know, with our, with our emotional uh, well-being is, is actually the church, whether you believe it or not. Because the church is supposed to be a family. It's a place where you come together with, with God's people. It's a place where you worship God. It's a place where God, you know, can touch your heart and God can change things uh, in, in, in your life. One of the opposite things about being in a church you know, the, the, the opposite of being in a church is being isolated. So isolation always, you know, makes the problem worse. So here is, a, here is Elijah isolating uh, himself. And then in verse 4, it says he was traveling all day. Now, there was no purpose for his travel, right? Whenever he traveled, it was always because God said, go there or go here, and then he traveled. But all of a sudden, he is just traveling all day. He's just going somewhere, perhaps not knowing where he should go, but he's just traveling and traveling and traveling, physically exhausting himself. I don't know if it's because he wanted to distract his mind from, you know, from this crisis that he is in. Maybe he wants to travel, he doesn't want to think about these things and he just wants to go somewhere. It's a distraction, maybe, right? And that's another thing we do when we feel overwhelmed and burdened. We want to turn to all kinds of distractions, and the number of distractions we have available in the world is, is, is crazy. People turn to their hobbies so that they can distract themselves from their pain. People turn to their bad habits sometimes to distract themselves. People turn to, you know, maybe media, entertainment, so that they can medicate their pain. But you know what happens when you turn to some form of distraction? At some point of the other, you know, at, at some point or the other, you have to leave that distraction, right? And you have to come back to reality. And guess what happens? You had the temporary relief when you were distracted for that brief moment. But once you're back to reality, that negative emotion which you've been feeling is now 10 times more heavy. Right? It's way more burdening on your heart. Because what our soul needs is not what the things of the world, you know, can, can provide. None of the things in the world can actually truly satisfy us and, and, and help us on the inside. But, the, you know, but people in the world, they are you know, sadly, right, just like we were, they are lost because oftentimes 
those are the things they they turn to for you know to to distract themselves from whatever it is that they're going through at least we know that there is another source of help and sometimes i think we also make that mistake and so here is elijah traveling traveling all day right we don't know where he is going and all of a sudden he is he is in this wilderness and then in verse 4 it says he sat down under a solitary broom tree he sat down under a solitary uh, tree now why did he sit down okay maybe he sat down to to take rest but i think the reason why he sat down i think we can know something about why he sat down from reading the next verse which is he prayed that god might take his life he prayed that he might die i think he sat down because maybe he realized the only solution was to just end his life maybe he thought the only solution to to deal with this the sudden rush of emotional trauma this fear and anxiety that he can't deal with the only solution is to just take his life is is to just end his life and so he decides to sit down under a solitary tree he is isolated disconnected from people and he's all by himself and he says god take my life please end my life right here and he says i can't take i can't take it anymore in verse 4 he says he prayed that he might die Isn't it amazing that God's mercy works even when we ask for the wrong things even when we you know when we are dece- when we when we don't know what we actually need God's mercy still works it was God's mercy that he didn't answer Elijah's prayer till today God hasn't answered his prayer you know that right Elijah he never died the bible says he was taken up to to heaven God hasn't answered that prayer even till today he prayed saying god please take my life i want to end my end my life i remember many years back uh, i used to take uh, guitar classes right for 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 many students and i remember seeing a man uh, you know who came uh, inquiring about the class because he was interested to join and as he was taking out the guitar from the bag i saw his forearm and i saw several cuts on his arm several deep cuts on his arm and uh, when i saw that i i kind of instantly knew what that was but but i didn't want to embarrass him by by asking him you know but i think what 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 it's probably you know what he did was perhaps he was going through some kind of a, you know a difficult time and it was too much for him to take and so he wanted to distract himself maybe from his emotional pain by cutting himself so that his physical pain can override his emotional pain so that he can forget about his is actual problems so that because this would be more distracting there are many people who actually do that i've seen i've seen uh, you know i think people in college i've seen uh, you know students in school doing things like that sometimes people think the the only way to escape the emotional pain is some kind of a physical pain so that they can distract from it and even the people who you know who've decided to uh, taken their lives right even the celebrities whom we read about who just suddenly en- ended their lives it's it's because they believe that the only solution ultimately is to just physically die and so here is elijah saying god please take my life that seems to be the only solution that seems to be the only way out and he says in verse 4 i've had enough lord no more strength that's the prayer of a man who says i have i don't have any strength left to to deal with this anymore i don't have any i've reached my limit and he says i'm no better than my ancestors who have already died he's also lost purpose he's lost his sense of purpose he lost he he's lost meaning in his work he's saying i'm no better than the the ancestors you know what he's actually saying is all this work which i've been doing all this ministry and you know challenging these people what has it actually brought no good results no fruit and 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 he's saying i'm no better than all the prophets you know all, all, all the uh, ancestors who stood for you and spoke for you how am i any better he's lost his sense of purpose in his work so at this point everything seems meaningless everything feels like there's no purpose to it all of life has just been meaningless even the work and the incredible ministry that he's been doing
And then in verse 5 it says, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. He fell asleep. It's like going to bed with a, with a heavy heart. Just before you say goodnight and go to bed, you've gone to bed with, with something weighing very heavily on your chest. And then came the turning point. In verse 5, it says, As he was sleeping, an angel touched him. I don't know if it's God's sense of humor. To send an angel to a man who's already terrified, who's so afraid, has fallen asleep, and, and God sends an angel to, to wake him up. I don't know how he would, he would react. You know, he, he opens his eyes and he sees an angel. That would be so terrifying, right? In the Bible, many places it says, you know, when the, when the angel appeared, the angel said, do not be afraid, <laughs> right? So I don't know, maybe he woke up and maybe the angel was like, stop screaming, Elijah. I'm just, you know, I'm just an angel from God here to help you. So an angel came, touched him, woke him up. And what did the angel say? Get up and eat. Verse 5, get up and eat. Notice the, the angel didn't come with a sermon. The angel didn't come with a lecture, with, with any kind of exhortation. You know, Elijah, how can you be like this? You've got to, got to be a man of God. Forgot all the miracles you did. No, the angel came and said, get up and eat. And the angel had prepared some food and then water. That's all the angel said. Just get up and eat. No lecture, no advice, nothing. God provided for his need first. What he needed the most at that point was, was not some kind of, you know, an exhortation. But it was... You know, it was it was uh, it was you know food and water for his for his physical body because he was he was tired. That's the first thing God did. And and here's a principle I want to draw from that: God actually cares for our physical body. You know, in in Christian thinking, we must never separate the spirit from the body. Of course, they are they're different, but we must never make the mistake of thinking that God only cares about our spiritual life. God only cares about our spirit. We must not separate our body and, and our spirit like we separate secular and, and you know, uh, religious. God cares very much for our physical body. You know, the uh, Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where God dwells. Right? He cares for our body. It says the, the Lord is for our body. And, and one of the things, you know, we can... We can uh, we can do to our bodies is to mistreat it, is to is to harm our bodies, right? And one of the common ways we, we do it is by by having a bad diet, right? And by not having a you know a, a regular routine of, of exercise. In fact, it was Paul who said, physical training is valuable, but training in godliness is more valuable because it benefits in this life and in the next life. Now, notice very carefully, he's not saying, forget about your physical training. And focus only on the spiritual training. He's not saying that. He's saying physical training is valuable. So he's not saying neglect your physical body. He's saying prioritize your spiritual life over your physical health. But he still says it's valuable. It is of some value. One of the reasons why we say smoking is wrong is because it's harmful to the body. It's not how God wants us to you know, treat our bodies, you know, harm our bodies. So when it comes to our diet, right, when it comes to the foods we eat, right, I think it's wise uh, to practice restriction and moderation, right? We have to restrict as much as possible when it comes to, you know, any kind of, you know, food that's bad for our body and we should be moderate, try to be moderate. It's a goal that, you know, I've been working towards, you know, for, I think for quite some time, right? to practice restriction and moderation. The... the Motivation is, is, to, is to steward the body. God wants us to steward our, our bodies. So the angel comes and you know, gives him food and water because God wants to first strengthen his body. Now there are times when we you know, indulge, right? But what we have to do is we have to save the indulgences for, for occasional times. When you want to indulge, we've got to save it for for special occasions. Right? Now, for some people, occasional means every single day. Now, that's not the meaning of occasional. It's on rare, rare occasions. In fact, many studies have showed that our physical health, right, the uh, condition of our physical health actually 
has a direct impact on our emotional well-being. Right. How we take care of our bodies actually is linked to to how we feel, to our to our emotional uh, health. And the one thing the angel didn't do is give Elijah a treadmill, right? Because he's got enough cardio. He's been walking for miles and miles and miles. He's set for cardio for the next one month. Right? So it's just food and food and water. But, but the point I'm making is God does care for our body and we do have a responsibility to steward our bodies, right, to take care of it. And then in verse 8, it says, Elijah got up, ate and drank. The food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, this is very important. God uh, took care of his body, provided for his body, and one of the reasons is because God wanted to strengthen Elijah to the point where he can travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, why Mount Sinai? You see, Mount Sinai uh, is a place of intimacy with, with God. It's a, it's a landmark in the Bible. It's where God spoke with Moses in a very intimate way. It's a place of communication between God and his, his beloved servant. And God is saying, I want you to go to this mountain, Mount Sinai. It's a special place. And it's a place where God meets in a very intimate and a personal way with his servant. So Elijah is told, now that you've eaten up, now that you're all strengthened up, make this journey, 40 days and 40 nights, and go to Mount Sinai. And what God wants to ultimately do is not just strengthen his body, but also strengthen his spirit. Strengthen his, his spirit. You know, when we feel anxious, when we are overwhelmed, when we are burdened, the way God helps us, the way God deals with us, helps us in those times is by calling us to Mount Sinai. He wants to go to Mount Sinai, which means he wants us to come to a place of intimacy with him. A place where you are all alone with him. And it's just God and you. And it's just a place for you to tell him all that's on your heart. And perhaps it's a place where God wants to tell you something. It's a place of intimacy. So when we are burdened, when we are emotionally you know, troubled, when it's too much to take, God, one of the first things God does is he invites us to Mount Sinai. Not, of course, not the physical place, but you know what I mean. You get the metaphor. He wants to invite us to a place of intimacy, a place of connecting with, with God. And in verse 9, the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Which is a strange question. We know that God is all-knowing. He has all the knowledge. So why is God asking this question? What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, one of the things God does is, before he speaks to us anything, he wants to hear from us, you know, first. He wants to hear everything that we have to say from our, from our hearts. And, and, and many uh, you know, scholars uh, you know, agree that the reason why God is asking this question is not for his uh, information, of course. It's because he wants to get Elijah talking with him. He wants to get Elijah to start telling God about all that's been going on on the inside. So, so God asks this question, what are you doing here, Elijah? Once again, no lecture, no advice, right? God, God is dealing with him in such a gentle and, and tender way. You know, one of the things we learn is if you want to help someone who is emotionally burdened, it's not wise to start bombarding, you know, that person with all kinds of advice and, you know, instructions, do this, do that. We have to do what God did. God asked questions and first listened to everything the person had to say. That's how you, you help out a person who is, who is emotionally burdened. Right? The person first wants somebody who can listen to them fully. So God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then Elijah says, verse 10, he says, God, I've, I've served you zealously, you know, but, but people... You know, they're not listening. They've, broke your, they've, they've broken your commandments again and again and they've killed all your prophets. Same story. And they want to kill me too. They want to take my life too, just like how they've killed the, the prophets. And his question is, God, why is this happening? This doesn't make sense. Why are you allowing this to happen? Why are things going this way when, when you're the one who is in control? And again, God doesn't answer his question. He doesn't, an he doesn't directly answer his question. And then... Something very interesting happens in the story. It says that all of a sudden, 
there was a huge storm where he was there was a huge storm and the, and the storm was so powerful and so frightening that rocks were flying out dangerous storm all of a sudden there was a storm and then it says god was not in the storm and then all of a sudden there was an earthquake the whole place is shaking and then it says god was not in the earthquake and then and then there's this fire and then it says god was not in the fire and then it says elijah heard a gentle whisper he heard something from god you know there are many ways people have interpreted that you know like what does that mean what just happened all of a sudden there is a uh, a storm there is an earthquake you know there is a fire and all of a sudden there is a gentle whisper and so some people say you know it just means that god is not in the chaos you can't hear god's voice you know in the earthquake you can't hear god's voice in the fire you can't hear his voice in the storm you can hear his voice only uh, when you are still and silent you know in a place where it's all quiet so some people interpret it that way of course the bible is not very clear on on what actually went down but but i just want to share what what i feel happened with you know with, with all these three things right the first thing is you know the the storm right and we don't have to draw any anything very very spiritual out of these three things so the first thing was a storm and then uh, an earthquake and then you know fire but one thing you realize is that all these were uh, natural uh, calamities right natural disasters right and if you notice elijah survived each one of these although it was dangerous rocks were flying not a single scratch on elijah's body maybe god was sending a silent message saying god you know elijah you see there was an earthquake there was fire there was storm but how come you didn't die in the earthquake how come you didn't die in the storm how come you didn't die in the fire how come there is not a single scratch on your body after all that's happened now it's because i have kept you safe it's because i am sovereign over all creation i'm sovereign over everything and it's like god is saying if i can keep you safe in the earthquake in the fire and in the storm then i can handle jezebel right if i can keep you safe from natural disasters which no man has control over then know that i'm sovereign and i can keep you safe and nobody can can lay a finger on you until i decide and and until i permit it right and your time will not come to an end until i decide and so maybe god was sending a silent message to uh, to elijah because a lot of times what we get worried about what what weighs us down and what makes us feel anxious is the things which we cannot control right the things which we can control are you know our own decisions our own choices which we have control over but there are many things which are not in our control like the outcome of a situation you know we don't know what the doctor is going to say we don't know why this person is sick all kinds of things which are not in our hands not in our control things which are uncertain that's what makes us feel anxious and god is saying do your best with what you can control but trust me with the uncontrollables trust me for the things that you cannot control and and just think about it is it even the things which we cannot control is it better if those things are in our hands or in god's hands even the things which are beyond our control it's better if it's in god's hands and not our hands but what's difficult is to trust him with the things that are beyond our control and god is saying you know to elijah i know you can't control jezebel but also know you can't control these these natural <laughs> disasters like earthquake and things but you have to know who is ultimately in control it's not ahab and it's not even jezebel it's me i'm sovereign and i'm in control of everything that exists and then one last time god asks him the question what are you doing here elijah see god is not done until we are we have fully poured out our heart to him right he doesn't want anything left in the heart he wants to be fully free fully unloaded and so god asks him again what are you doing here elijah and elijah says the same thing same story and and perhaps as he's done telling god you know they've killed the prophets they want to kill me too he's poured out his heart he's told god everything he wanted to say and finally elijah is actually emotionally free he's unburdened himself like what the psalmist says cast your burdens on the lord and he will sustain you you know what god was doing with elijah he was he was getting elijah to cast all his burdens on him that's the process through which god took him taking him to mount sinai a place of connecting with him you know intimacy all that so that 
just to help Elijah cast all his burdens on God because only God enough to only God is strong enough to carry uh, your burdens and we know that Elijah was was free he was fully free because God right in the next verse gave him the next mission gave him the next job god is not going to you know send him to his next job when he's not when he's not ready for it right when he's when he's emotionally troubled god's going to first set him free and then give him the next mission and that's what god did right in the next verse god says you know here's my next job for you go and anoint these three men go and anoint these three men that's my next job that's that's the next mission for you and so it, it's a very simple thing that god wants us to uh, do when we are anxious it's it's to simply pray and cast all our burdens on him and ask him to carry our burdens now the story does not say that elijah was you know was free you know he ca- he cast all his burdens on on god and then he went right back to the tree and sat down and started thinking about his problems all over again which which is i think what many many of us end up doing we we connect with god god gives us a word he sets us free he makes us he helps us but the next day we want to go back to the tree and we want to start thinking about you know the crisis all over again god doesn't say anything about jezebel he doesn't say anything about what happened uh, you know about the threat about how god is going to handle all that at that point god doesn't tell him anything god simply tells him to move on with his next mission god has plans like that for each one of us god has specific plans for each one of us and God God is ready to set us free you know from from all the emotional baggages or any kind of things that we but God doesn't want us to go back and get stuck in the past right he doesn't want us to be stuck in the past he wants us to move on with the next plans that he has for us right and so we got to make sure that we are not stuck with the same thing that God has already helped us with God wants us to get unstuck and move on with the next mission that he has planned for us and prayer is the means by which we we cast all our burdens on god paul says you know do not worry about anything be anxious for nothing we get anxious about many things right it's it's not it's not impossible it's impossible to to be anxious for nothing but paul says be anxious for nothing because of the next verse he says be anxious for nothing but in everything pray and and ask god to to help you make your requests known to god he's saying don't stop with with feeling anxious every anxiety that we feel is an invitation from god to pray to him it's an invitation from god to talk to him and then god gives a final fact to to elijah the final you know a point that that god makes to elijah is he says by the way elijah you've been saying all this time you're the only one you're the only one left let me tell you by the way there are 7000 who haven't bowed down to to Baal there are 7000 people who are who are still faithful to me you're not the only one and let that encourage you we have to notice that god doesn't say this in the beginning right god wants to first hear from elijah he wants to help elijah first and then give the facts there are 7000 who are still faithful to me and then elijah moves on to the next mission that god has for him the next plans so i lend the story there so remember that god wants to steward our bodies he wants us to take care of our bodies because it does affect our our well being our overall well being right but our priority is of course our spiritual life right and god wants us to trust him for all the things that we cannot control and god wants us to meet him at mount sinai meet him alone and pray and god wants us to not be stuck with the past with the problems in the past but move on you know seek for his plans seek his will and seek for his plans and move on in that in that direction god bless you let's let's pray god we just thank you for your for your tenderness we thank you for the way you deal with each one of us we thank you lord that you've showed us how you were so gentle with with elijah lord how you were so tender with him you were so patient with him And God we thank you that you you're willing to listen to each one of us any time Lord when we need you. You are there for us any time we need you Lord Jesus and we thank you for that. God I just I just pray that God we will 
Lord, we will seek to hear from you, Lord, what you want us to do, Lord. We want to we wanna seek your plans for us, Lord. We want to move ahead, Lord, with the plans that you have for us and not be stuck anywhere. So, God, I just pray that you will, you will give us the, the, the grace, you will give us, Lord, you will give us mercy to, and, and you will give us what we need, Lord, as you, as you always do. We thank you for that. And I just pray, Lord, that you will help us, Lord, help us seek your face and help us, Lord, meet with you every single day alone and, and spend time with you, Lord, because that's what you desire the most. And we just thank you for all that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of the Father be with us till Jesus comes again. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.